Recently, while having so much fun with villains, I decided to create a separate video to specifically discuss Pixar villains, something I already did a while back but decided to create a ranking on it. And yes, if you're still asking if I'm working on the DreamWorks villains ranking, I am so in the background, so you will still have that to look forward to. But anyways, with that said, it comes the obligatory rules for this video when it comes to villains, especially those in Pixar. This rules out any film that features no villains whatsoever where despite loving them, they still don't have that opposing force at all, and this includes very much minor characters to the story overall that, that could be that way so I would mainly focus on the ones that are the main antagonists to the overall story. And with mentioning stuff like that, I know you will get what I mean when we start this ranking so let us finally actually begin. Nothing about Cars 2 gives me meaning in life. Everything about this is totally stupid and the villain in Miles Axelrod is totally stupid. He's a billionaire who's supposed to be an oil tycoon who suddenly shifted towards environmentally friendly caused by this all in all as the alternative fuel but also used that to secretly blow up cars so that people could go back to using oil to get rich from that yet again which doesn't make any sense. He is very shallow and stupid and doesn't realize how he could have gotten a lot of money off of the safer alternative fuels but no, they just wanted to make major to have the grand spy plot and the hero of the adventure and ruin the point of cars for some damn reason. It's just completely idiotic and would have been better if they made the lemon cars more of the central villains of the movie. It wouldn't change much anyways but better than this landy dandy dumbass who could have used both to actually continue oil or whatnot. It just says cars as the concept in Cars 2 just doesn't make sense at all for why they would actually switch to one alternative fuel because they're actual living machines. There's just literally nothing else to talk about here man because Cars 2 is literally the worst Pixar film and sequel that has ever been made. So much so I can feel my soul escaping my body right now and I need to move on from this point. The more times I think about The Incredibles 2, the more I actually hate it because of the villain itself. No matter how much I say she sucks, she still keeps getting worse for me on each rewatch. She's literally the most stupidest villain on this list for a variety of reasons, especially helping the good guys at the beginning when her plan is a smaller scale of syndrome to keep supers out of the limelight for good, like she actively helps her brother against her own plans just to be the villain of the film. I also never really found the idea of the screen slaver to work when the trailers came out, so it just wasn't interesting to me and she definitely proved that point with a plan that is just as bad as Miles Axelrod when it comes down to the entire plot of the movie. What's even worse is how this all stems from this mistake that their dad made to actually call Zoopers where they just were made illegal at the time that actually got him killed because they never actually wanted to go in the basement. Where for that reason she decided to have this petty vengeance against Supers returning because of its stupidity while her brother actually wanted to bring back Supers because of his stupidity. Like literally this family is pretty stupid when you think about it because everything in this movie was just cobbled up together because they somehow could not find a way to continue the story of where we left off on and actually could have made the Underminer as the main villain of the film because he's the one who's an actual villain that could have actually had some stakes to the plot. To me, this was more totally stupid than Evelyn. It's another terrible twist villain where the villain turns out to be an older Buzz. Like, they really didn't even know how to write a compelling evil character in the original Zerg like what the series did, and I just don't get it. I just do rank him higher because I really hate the other two on this list, and I just really felt bored of the Delightyear movie as a whole. I may not get why it fits in the overall movie about finishing the missing and fixing your mistakes, but I just find it really mediocre for a movie that attempted to be something beyond what we know of in the Buzz Lightyear character trying to be more real or grounded but never really hinted that in the first half of the movie. Like you never really set up this happening and got people expecting that this would be a regular main villain to the story because it's Zerg, but you just had to make a relatable twist villain and it hasn't worked for all of its story. And yeah, besides that, there isn't really much to say about him, so let's move on. The Good Dinosaur, as we all know, isn't a good movie, and neither is the villain of the film, where, where he isn't in a, a whole lot, where it focuses more on Arlo and Spot as characters instead. They just appear as a big conflict in the film at first to Arlo, where they are rescuers but are actually there to eat because they are actually carnivores. I just rank him higher because at least he is more of a villain than the other ones previously on this list, where of course he gets defeated at the end, not confirmed dead but just defeated as a typical villain would. Other than that, there really isn't much to the story, and it is truly one of the weakest that Pixar has made overall. 
You know, Cars as a franchise just doesn't really have much in the villain department, and Jackson Storm is truly a part of that. He's mainly there to show off the newer generations of arrogance as shown by the return of Chick Hicks and what's not, and that's basically it. He's only there for McQueen to put him in the same situation as Doc Hudson, and of course priming up Cruz to compete with that, which he does, and which after she wins, he is just out of the movie, where they really just don't care about him at all after that, which is truly disappointing. But then again, there isn't really much for him to offer in that role other than the point that is understandable again, but I just wish Cars had more to offer in their villains in the first place. It's just something that is more forgettable when they just automatically forget about him when Chick Hicks was more involved in a little bit of the story after the victory or defeat or whatever, and frankly it didn't need to work overall for the story to focus on McQueen's journey, but it is there for the story and I didn't mind it too much, but it's still as weak as these other villains. I was debating whether ranking him higher or lower on this list, but I realized for the most part he's not the central focus anyways of the story because for the most part he is a bear and well a man whose spirit is trapped in bear to focus on the main conflict of the film with Merida and her mother, where of course Brave wasn't that very interesting anyway. More do is there for the backstory so that Merida couldn't repeat the same mistakes both in terms of the past and right in the moment where he's just a mindless monster terrorizing every human and at the very least I do like it when he gets redeemed at his end when his spirit is freed, and how Merida's mom actually saves her from the end, which I guess is the only real reason why I should rank him this high in the list, because Brave itself is really forgettable. I mean, I really can't remember much of the plot after the first 5 minutes because I really don't find it interesting at all. They just screwed up everything from this production to its story in the first few minutes, and he is truly a part of that issue, so I justify why he should be ranked on this list at least this low because of how shallow everything in the film is. It's not great, but it's not terribly bad, so let's just move on to the next. In an unnecessary destructive film, Gabby Gabby suffices for the type of toy she is in vain with other Toy Story villains. Of course, unlike the other one, she isn't inherently a villain throughout the film who just wants to be loved by an owner whose voice box just didn't work. Like I include her here because at least she continues those themes of the other toys feeling abandoned or left behind and has initial antagonism against Woody for his voice box where that is virtually it when it comes to villainy. Because this film doesn't really want to focus on that and instead on Woody and Bo Peep's adventure where at least I can appreciate this interesting take more so other than their previous villains on this list. And yeah, I know it's kind of disappointing that this is short, but there really isn't much to talk about them, and frankly, the ending actually satisfied her with a new owner anyway, and I guess he gets the redemption she deserves. You know, I actually like Luca, and I think at the very least the villain of the story is okay, mainly because he is a bully. He's just very simple, and it's what you think a villain is supposed to be when you were younger, and that's okay for the simple type of story that is Pixar made with Luca. I like him because of how big his ego is, with the point he thinks everyone in Puerto Rosso adores and respects him, when in fact nearly everyone despises him. I mean, you can even see this in his lackeys where they clearly do not enjoy helping him out in any way because he's just so st stuck up and mean. He does things mainly out of greed for himself, going after stuff if he is guaranteed to get a prize for it. He also shows similar murderous traits when he attempted to kill Luca and Alberto so that he could win putting her on another level of villainy. And for those reasons, I enjoy having fun with him for a movie that doesn't really focus on him being integral to the story and could even work without him, but at the very least it was better at the time where most stories just really didn't feature any main big villain at all if we consider the previous Onward and Soul movies and other Disney movies at the time. So despite not being there for most of the time, at least I did have a little fun with him actually returning back to the main villainy of Pixar. Now when it comes to an underrated movie like Monsters University, it's hard to pick out a main villain in the story because it focuses more on the development of Mike and Sully as friends, where you had them go through the backstory of Randall which wasn't really focused on too much, and Dean Hardscrabble is just strict by the book character, where only Johnny Worthington was the main definitive antagonizing force for both characters. I think they did well to represent him to have a typical fraternity bro that most would associate college, especially with the movies, where of course I certainly wouldn't know because I didn't really spend a huge time in college before dropping out, or now this is my life instead, but I still think it was good to have that conflict for the story, to have something really drill in the idea for Mike to who thinks he knows what he wants before realizing something else that we see him in within Monsters Inc. It's very understandable as a villain to see him care this much about his selfish egotistical ways to preserve his reputation and his definitions of the elite scarers being ju so judgmental on Mike. Most of this seems based on the fact he's trying to preserve his reputation, showing some sort of value to his family as many actually go through trying 
someone to look up to, and that is understandable to some degree. But then most of the time, he's just a simple jerk. But still, it makes sense in the grand scheme of the movie's message that is clearly different from Monsters, Inc. itself. But still disappointing that the film couldn't fully flesh out its backgrounds like Randall to really give us that kind of backstory to explain his antagonism, but I digress and it's fine and it's for its time. Now, Anton Ego is of course the overall antagonist for most of the film as a critic who broke Remy's idol's Gusto's heart and of course the final test and judge that Remy has to face when he breaks. Of course, he is not evil or the most villainous when we see that later portrayed in characters like Skinner, but he is overall harsh and cold-hearted when it comes to his dastardly reviews. With that said, he isn't going to be ranked highest because he isn't inherently a main threat to the characters, but just to the reputation overall, where of course he gets redeemed in the end. I like they present him as a tall, brooding figure who only dishes out the most brutal reviews where everyone fears him and reveres him as a critic that caused the downfall of Gusto and the one that sent Remy on this journey to find his passion. And you still constantly think about him throughout because he sets a reputation on the restaurant which these chefs are trying to reclaim where they are worried which critic is actually there in the restaurant where they had the same opinions about the declining quality and passion where Remy's cooking actually brought that back where Ego actually wants a taste of that anchored at the popularity it experienced again. After closing the book on Gusto in terms of restaurant and its broken heart that made him pass away. And of course, when he challenges them to make their best is where we see his heart get changed, serving the most simple dish of ratatouille that returned him to his own mother's cooking. The heart of being changed by simple food that your mother just made that made him love food in the first place. And this is where he finally understood Gusto's words that true talent can come from anywhere in the world and get a happy ending just being an investor in the end. While not a true villain, Ego certainly is a real one that gets changed for the better rather than just destroyed because they refuse as many other villains are like. And that's what I liked about him, one that has done right being sympathetic knowing his background and gets a redemption well deserved, unlike most villains however. While certainly not getting the most screen time, Darla suffices for being a big threat to tiny fish like Nemo, because throughout the film, humans are portrayed as big monsters above the little fish that of course start the journey that Marlin has to go through on finding Nemo, where Darla just doesn't care where little kids are literally the devils of this world. The way they show the size difference really makes the effects stand out and puts in the fear of the little fishes that we all know. And of course, like most children, she is spoiled and immature where her behavior has killed fish before because she is that stupid. And of course, being the niece of Philip Sherman, she has to get the special treatment because that's just how it works in families. All in all, it works really well for the main story being an adventure for Marlin and Dory to find Nemo and just there because kids are evil. You know, it really surprised me to think that I would rank a Cars villain higher up on this list, but considering our other options, I guess it's no surprise. Voiced by the one and only Michael Keaton, Chick Hicks is a really fantastic addition to the movie, showcasing another mustache-faced arrogant racer who actually wins in the end but also loses at the same time. Like the other Cars villains, he's not very important to the story and could have been told without it, but he still adds so much to it to why Lightning is the way he is and the stakes behind the thrill of the races they do. He also has memorable lines like Kajiga to Lightning's Kachow and has this very bombastic attitude when it comes to being in the spotlight. I mean, the best thing about him is how he proclaims it's the start of the chick era, but, but by the events of the Cars 2, it has already ended before it even began. Basically, he, he's riding off the good sportsmanship of McQueen to get a prize where he literally gets nothing in the end, where McQueen gets everything instead that all racers actually wanted. Of course, he also pushes other cars around to get crashed, which is also another villainous plus. All in all, Chick Hicks remains to be the most villainous of the Cars franchise and the most evil than the previous ones on the list because, you know, he's just that fun. Many people don't like Otto for being static and just simply following programming, where he's just not in vain like HAL 9000 or how other AI would act to form their opinions against humanity, but I really disagree and I think he works the way he does. The reason Otto is a good villain in my opinion while not being in the top 10 is because he represents the humans of old, the old ones in the old videos of Wally that showed our ignorance and stagnant attitude of complacency that made us lose our way and become the way we are in the film. Like everything about the film is focused on, on what we would become if we were to lose our way, represented within his live action characters and of course later on shown in the CGI humans and of course Otto himself, how he slowly took control over the ship beyond the captain because of our own complacent attitude. He is simply following the ideals of humanity for the past 700 years where Captain McCrea suddenly realizes that about what we actually lost in the process, that we survived rather than lived, and that's what was important to the story. It's more important especially in an age of increased technology and AI reliance where we 
we are losing ourselves in the process giving ways to things like by and large corporations and the axiom being controlled by a steering wheel. Yes, there is more to be desired than having a robotic wheel with sentience controlling the ship and being the antagonist, but it's even more better when you actually understand the message that the movie is trying to present to you. Using those two worlds actually make you feel closer to the film, having something we know seeing us on the screen personally in an animated film and seeing what becomes of us throughout the actions of the old in Otto. And for those reasons, I think he suffices enough for being right here on this list because he still isn't as compelling as other villains being static, but fits right into the story and the realization of such characters where mostly it is a love story between two robots in the grand scheme of things. As par for the course with human villains in early Pixar, Sid Phillips is another bully like Darla who uses toys for his own twisted experiments. His role is to be the antithesis of Andy instead of loving toys and playing with them and just using them for his own messed up purposes for the sake of doing so. This is reflected in the style of his room and the style on his t-shirt that really does spell out child bully to everyone, even his own sister. His idea of fun is a good way to represent that twisted attitude of how some kids act around in life, especially around toys, where of course the the main message of Toy Story is about being there for each other to be loved, where that is not the case of what Sid Phillips does at all. I mean, as a bully, you wouldn't think he'd be higher on this list, but just being a human and the first Pixar villain does put him as high as number 10 on this list, for being so evil that he tortures both Woody and Buzz for no reason other than he enjoys it for the sake of enjoying it. Like clearly, all the messed up toys he owns that Woody actually thinks as creepy at first turns out to be nice because they're just once regular toys who got tortured and experimented on by a twisted 11 year old boy. His defeat is the best part of the movie and his character where he remains to be the only human who has been interacting with toys, talking him directly, scaring him for what he had done. It's a perfect twist on the twisted character turning his creations against him and somehow scar him for life. So much so he becomes the garbage boy in Toy Story 3. And overall by this point you can assume he has been redeemed to some degree, taking a different approach to life while retaining some of his punk attitude like wearing the same skull t-shirt or just jamming out the music while he just works as a normal human. Not overall evil anymore but somehow redeemed to be a regular working Joe. Nothing too special, but just harkening back to Pixar's first movie, that is one of their classics that really did change modern animation that we've seen today. Stinky Pete proved how much Pixar has improved over their two movies by moving on to a simple bully human to a toy who started to challenge the point of being loved as a toy by a kid and so on. I can truly say he has set the basis of modern toys villains by starting out a sympathetic, unopened toy who remained in the box so it wasn't gotten the chance to be sold and loved by a kid. I mean, you can understand where he comes from where he forces Woody to stay because of his emotional pain that he went through when you see him get introduced to him and when he commits to his villainous ways. It is strengthened by other characters like Jesse who felt abandoned be because of how we as kids grow up and when mature where we stop playing with our toys but finding that second chance in Andy all over again, where at the very least it convinced the prospector's argument to be on display behind a glass where kids can just watch them forever rather than locked up in storage wasting for eternity because our kids grow up. His character just comes from a place that wasn't loved at all in his life being so embittered that is fully understandable as a villain and really strengthens the main themes of Toy Story that it is known for and why each sequel, except for four, was greater than the last. I mean, he is so good at predicting the ending of Toy Toy Story 3, where they literally kept his words in mind, where also at the very least off screen he gets redeemed where they force him to be a girl's toy where he thinks he suffered at first but actually discovers he likes it later on. It's not in the film but it's more of a redemption arc that was nice that was needed to be explained because all he really needed was to be loved by a kid which he never got in the first place. If he had that when he first came out he wouldn't have been so embittered to begin with. Putting how perspective is everything and once you experience something you get to understand the points that people opposed. I mean, yeah, he is the secondary antagonist overall in Monsters, Inc., but his character certainly is interesting, where I really wanted to see more of him in the prequel again, but understand what they were going for if that's the way it is because of how little I spent in time in college or universities. But moving on from that point, what I know about Randall, on the other hand, is something different and really good for the story, where he is a highly competitive rival to Sully who just wants to be at the top and goes about it in a creepy, sly way. It's very interesting how they make him a compelling threat by disguising within backgrounds to get the element surprise on his foes. Like he could have stopped Sully if it weren't for Mike, making him powerful on his own against Big Brutes by James because of his slick, disguised attitude. At heart, he's an opportunist who just never gets the chance to shine against Sully and has no respect for anyone else, enough to convince Waternoose, who is desperate to save his company, to help in the plot which he still berates him for. It's just more delicious to think he gets beat by a human girl at the end of things because of how arrogant he was. And like Sully says at the end, he is out of the job being forced to spend eternity in the human world 
world being beat up by two humans who apparently have alligators show up at their trailer ever so often. Which really means I'm pretty sure this apparently takes place in Florida by the looks of things. So with that said, he has been condemned to hell, which I don't think he will ever come back alive from that very encounter. All in all, I love Steve Buscemi and what he gave to Randall, so he deserves his ranking as number 8 on this list. In Pixar's second film, they really outdid themselves by making a huge villain like Hopper in contrast to the ants of the film. His character wants control and he wants to be top of other animals he deems to be inferior in any way. Where even though he's massive, most of his characters acts out of fear. He wants to better himself by manipulating others, even his own kind, including his brother, to get what he needs. He doesn't care about others unless it directly benefits him in any way. Because he sees mercy and compassion as weaknesses, really thinking ants are lower than dirt to service others higher than them. But that's not what without the fear for him because of how many there are. While being huge against them, he really is weak on most other scales because if one can be convinced to turn against them, they will overpower and defeat them because of how unified they are as the force that we see at the end of the film. And of course, he was obviously scared of creatures bigger than him like birds because they eat grasshoppers, where at first he laughs because he thinks it was the ants who made the makeshift version, which failed at first, but then again, they all rise up against the grasshoppers, where this entire facade of them being so powerful breaks down, where he tries to escape, getting face to face by a real bird in the end, giving him the shock of his life in the circle of life getting fed to the little chicks, most likely being chopped into separate pieces, leaving them with one of the most gruesome fates in a Pixar movie to date. I mean, for its time, in Pixar's second film, Kevin Spacey did a great job as a villain who was so good at being a manipulator rather than its physical strength, and of course the best part of the movie that isn't the greatest Pixar film now, but still remains to be great for the time to establish themselves as the premier 3D animated studio. Henry J. Waternoose the Third is one of the most iconic Pixar villains ever made for so many reasons. The main reason I like him particularly because like him, I too am the third in my family and I just like that for some petty reasons and also because he is a twist villain who acts out of preservation presented as the kind boss who loves Sully because he is his top scarer and is actually devoted to ensuring his company survive no matter the cost to keep the monster world running as is. His villainy only comes out of desperation for the failing numbers they have been experiencing which is real and very understandable to how many companies face in real life. I mean, why wouldn't I rank him higher as a villain otherwise when he says such iconic lines as this one? I'll kidnap a thousand children before I let this company die. This line really shows why he deserves to be a main threat because he's so desperate to do whatever it takes to save the company, proclaiming that it would die without him, going to desperate measures to protect it despite having his compassion for others like Sully because he's so willing to do something so evil that we all don't like in our own society as humans and whatnot just to kidnap children. It's so nice to present him as this grandfather attitude that has been taking care of things with a gentle but firm fist, but then growing irrational as the movie progresses. As I discussed before about what makes twist villains work is because they commit to their intentions and when they are revealed to be opposing the heroes, they grow more erratic because that's how they truly were to begin with, unlike some other bitch the other studio created because of how stupid they really were. Lotso Hugging Bear remains to be Toy Story's best villain that continues the sentiments of other characters like Jesse or even Stinky Pete to that extent that get influenced later on in Gabby Gabby about being loved as a toy and caring for your owner. It's just that through the revelation where one mishap happens, it can change a person mentally, where in this case, it is for the worse where he rules with a secret iron fist at a daycare. Everything about him does spill twist on right because of how he's presented as a loving caring bear who smells like strawberries but is benevolent enough where he puts most of Andy's toys where kids act the most aggressive towards. How all of this is actually because of his background feeling left behind where he was kind but wants others to experience this harsh reality where he can have a supply of loving kids himself in the butterfly room where kids are actually more mature with playtime and such. We see this trait at the very beginning where he tries to convince toys like Woody that Andy no longer cares for toys like him because of this misunderstanding that his worldview is messed up because of how this one mistake that changed everything that solidified himself to make him embittered and shallow because they never returned and how Daisy parents got a new Lotso to make up for that left behind mistake. No matter how hard one can try to convince him that she actually loved him, he refuses to accept that because he takes things as is rather than looking at the broader picture because he is just so full of himself, so arrogant, so much so that he refuses Big Baby's cries who he once cared about for her mother because of how his own selfish ego of pain that never left him. And this is where his words are made ironic because of how toys are just eventual trash to be thrown away and that's exactly what happens to him and the fate he gets and deserves when he 
leaves the others behind because of how petty he was, now being forced to live the rest of his miserable days in front of a garbage truck because that's what he really is. A collection for trash to left to rot with flies as discussed by the others on the grill, laughing at the fate of this cuddly bear who wanted to destroy any connections to humans because they are nothing like trash like he is now. The perfect villain that Toy Story has ever made in their story. You know what? I love Skinner and I don't care what anyone else says about his character. He's just so fun in Ratatouille being a short Frenchman who cares nothing but frozen microwave burritos being in charge of Gusto's restaurant. His paranoia about rats really gets me going, being the ill-mannered French short version of Gordon Ramsay who really doesn't care about the well-being of the restaurant especially because some garbage boy knew how to cook food, apparently. I mean, understandable that he messed up in the first place but a little overblown knowing the facts we now know. I mean, that iconic letter really sent him in a frenzy of conspiracy knowing that Linguini is Gusto's son sent here to destroy him and what he owns now. I mean, he's not inherently villainous, just overly angry and paranoid. I mean, ever since he saw a rat, he can think nothing but chase it down where everyone else just views him as this crazy lunatic who runs a restaurant. One who literally sped around Paris chasing after them and falling into the water only for that to be destroyed, living nothing but spite and wanting Remy to make him food to become rich and successful until he gets tied up by a bunch of rats at the end of the film. I mean, I can fully understand understand as a villain why he shouldn't be ranked higher but it's just that I love him for the way he is and really couldn't ask more for something better at this point. I mean Ratatouille by itself is just too good of a film to let him be ranked lower so you kind of understand my points about this and the message about how anyone can cook and how people like Skinner actually worked against the message of the movie because they don't believe in that. They believe in the old ways of small pools that are just small and prefer these most simple ways that shuts out any creative art or passion that the movie wants to present us with a rat as the main character. And yet, yeah, if you take away everything else of the movie, it is a film about a man who goes insane because the wrong soup got served and this purple letter, and which I really believe that film by itself could be a masterpiece on its own. But of course, there are better villains out there in the case of Pixar. I mean, I have to say this is Pixar's best twist villain they have ever created, one who already got the victory being in the spotlight at the beginning of the film. At first glance, Ernesto presents himself as charming, suave, wise, friendly, and sensible individual who encourages others to follow their dreams no matter what, making him seem like a positive role model to so many individuals in the living world. I mean, Ernesto saved Miguel when he fell in his pool of genuine kindness and actually was gently going to, to give him his blessing and allow him back to the land of the living. I mean, that is, that was before Miguel discovered his secret, so it is debatable whether this was an act of decency, was sincere or not, where they do a better job of setting up this secret where you get to twist way better in the style they present him as. Even so, in the beginning, I could tell the hints of him being the villain because of how proud he was where everyone just put him in the spotlight that gets him comically killed by a bell. This actually makes it more sweeter when it is revealed about his secret and the truth about Miguel's heritage later revealed that Ernesto was selfish, vain, fame hungry, and desperate in his life to the point of being a rank opportunist. His ambition was so extreme that it drove him to murder his best friend in Hector who wanted to go home to his family, where he subsequently stole his songbook and guitar to achieve that fame and glory. Like literally you couldn't get more villainous than that where you go and murder your best friend who wanted to see his own family and just use those songs to just to make yourself famous because you're just that petty where everyone actually turns on him knowing the truth about what was who wanted to do whatever it takes to seize his moment throwing his child off a building before being so smug about it he got what he wanted where now everyone saw the true nature about him and turned against him being a selfish opportunist where now everything about him was destroyed finally lifted by Pepita to his humiliation before being smacked into another bell, crushed once again, finally cementing his fate from where he once began, to be smushed and forgotten after everyone from the dead to the living knew of his crimes, putting Hector back on top. A truly fantastic villain from the get-go for a good film like Coco. Up is a fantastic movie and Charles Muntz is a fantastic villain. I mean, right from the get-go, you see his motivations that carry over throughout, which is why he works so well when he reveals his villainous ways because of how real his obsession is. I mean, from the beginning, he cares about adventure and shows off the beast of the unknown pursuing a dream for everyone else to see. Like, he also isn't inherently a bad guy, although he did kill two people, but he's just overly obsessing after a dream that is almost dead at this point. Like, he literally has nothing to gain for being 
being a 90 year old man stuck in the jungles of South America chasing after a bird because of how this first one was fake so he set out on this mission to clear his name but it also got lost in it and possibly forgotten by modern society. He presents himself as very charismatic being the idols to Ellie and Carl and virtually the catalyst for the events of the film in the first place where even that fact is clear where he's reintroduced as proud of what he accomplished but when it comes down to the things that he searched for his own life he actually forgets about anything else but his dogs to hunt down his goal no matter the cost. I mean this film clearly shows he is smart inventing a collar allowing dogs to communicate despite being trapped for so many years at least knowing how much time goes on passing with technology but still in the end grand scheme of things his obsession is the one that still kills him in the end. Literally chasing after a dream that causes his own downfall in the literal sense. No one else is actually responsible for that but himself for the way he was set up as a villain. The one thing that causes him to get defeated that not even Carl or Russell actually did but just him instead. Like people make the great point that if the real adventure is not Carl going down to Paradise Falls but the one he had with Ellie over the years with the great adventure that is just life itself in front of you sharing that with other people and one he harkened back with Russell himself at the end of the film a renewed appreciation for life and the adventures that awaits him. Like despite everything he still helped the main characters in more ways than one representing something that is still stuck in the past like his dream to go to Paradise Falls where once again adventure just isn't out there but it is right in front of you and everything you do in your life and finding that is greater than going down to a dream that is flawed to extreme where birds like Kevin must be protected instead. I love everything about him and I thank Christopher Plummer for lending his voice to the role. I mean, let's be honest, I wouldn't have ended this list without any other like Syndrome himself. Because I don't think there is any doubt who is the most villainous like him because everyone who knows of Pixar actually agrees with his sentiment that Syndrome is the number one Pixar villain ever created. He's the most fun and the most evil of the bunch dead set on fixing a mistake upon looking up to heroes. It's fun to see his backstory effectively shaped by the hero of the story whose mistakes and arrogance as one not caring for those who cared about them caused the chain of events that starts the movie off. I mean, everything he does does to avoid him kind of causes a chain reaction where the public actually shames supers into hiding by law and causes him into this depressed state where he is at the start of the film. And ironically enough, Syndrome is the one that actually gives Mr. Incredible the second chance so he can commit to his plans from his twist that he is the one responsible for all these omnidroids and deaths. What makes him so great is how twisted he views things only caring about Mr. Incredible and not remembering anything else from his flashbacks focus on his rejection that changed his life to be embittered by supers despite causing chaos to begin with. He only cared for the rush of being a super rather than saving the day for people. We see this in his character so much how much he cared about their powers and being in the spotlight where he is also shown to be a super genius inventing things that can turn people into their own supers. He also has one of the greatest kill counts of any other villain in Pixar or even Disney himself where he almost completely wiped out most of the known supers much to Mr. Incredible's surprise. The most effective scene in any movie to prove how much he is a threat where he's committed genocide where even he just knows that and even he knows how much he gets caught monologuing. It really brings up more than other previous villains or even super villains for matter into this genre that really brings out the best in the message of the movie about what it is and all about getting caught up in the glory days that prevented Mr. Incredible from seeing the true value of family instead. Everything he does is out of recognition for wanting to put his talents to use where the world didn't really see any of that in him. That they refused to put him on because of this ego driven crusade that caused him to open up his sadistic tendencies because of how he was raised as a child influenced by what he saw on the surface. There are many traits to his character that actually suggests that even if Mr. Incredible accepted him, he still wouldn't have learned the true value of a hero from how he actually turned out as a person and as a villain in the movie, that he wanted to kill supers for the sake of propping himself up instead to save the day from his own inventions and using that to sell to everyone to get rich and have people solve their own problems proving that society never really needed to look up to heroes to begin with. Something vastly superior than what was set up with Evelyn Dever with weaker motivations that are similar in vain to getting rid of supers like Syndrome himself. He also is very comedic on the side that still has a fanboy side to him, showing that he still has the same Buddy Pines personality as before, but just developed into what he always was from the start when he matured as an adult. Just a big sociopath and egotistical maniac. And because of that attitude, he got what he deserved in the end with his own death, one that was foreshadowed by Edna Mode about wearing capes mainly because it looked cool for him and the fact he wanted to kidnap a baby, who frankly overpowers him in so many ways that one that gets him sucked up into an jet engine instead, being another gruesome 
awesome death for a character that also exploded in the very end as overkill. Everything about him is the best of what a Pixar villain could be and the most mature in the nature of storytelling that The Incredibles is known for and sort of affects the sequel as well with everything in his shadow and just repeating everything again to make supers legal again. For those reasons, he of course is the best they have ever produced and I love them for it. While younger and less numerous than Disney villains, these villains certainly have more fun elements to them than what Disney has offered, really going for the wacky and grand nature that these movies really presented and it's why I like them for that. Of course, they don't have the best track record either, but it still suffices for a studio that can have films done with or without them that the other studio actually mostly fails at. And I really hope with this video is that we can actually have more of these villains in Pixar because we really need those stories that are challenged by different views and having major villains play a deep part is really important to me. I mean, I don't mind Pixar going for stories without them, but I really just need them in these films again. I do hope you enjoyed this short look about each one where this video has really exhausted me out of everything. So with that said, I'm all done. So goodbye.